What the fuck is up? Welcome back. My name is Noah Hills. You can catch me on Twitter at Noah More Parties. And today's video is a breakdown of my personal top 10 running backs in Dynasty Leagues. I don't know what else I have to say. This is my top 10 running backs in Dynasty Leagues. Let's do it. <laughs> We're going to start at RB10. I think I'm probably going to put out multiple videos with my Dynasty running back rankings. Maybe through RB20, maybe through RB30, I don't know. But I'm starting at 10 and going down to 1, and then the next video will be like 20 to 11. So that doesn't really make sense, but that's how I'm doing it. Seems like that's the way it should be done, even though it doesn't make any sense. But RB10 is Austin Eckler, currently being selected as the RB7 in Dynasty Leagues per DLF. And kind of the deal with Austin Eckler is, I think he's a really good player. Um, obviously went undrafted a few years ago in 2017. I think he was part of that class. Undersized, played behind Melvin Gordon, played with Melvin Gordon for a couple years, um, got his chance as the main guy. And he's played really well the last couple years, despite like a lack of touchdowns in some of those seasons, sharing carries in some of those seasons, not getting like first and second down roll some of those seasons but last year he was fully unleashed he scored 20 touchdowns or something like that and so all of a sudden like Austin Eckler is this like elite fantasy scorer elite touchdown scorer did he become that was he always that did something else change like how should we view Austin Eckler going forward in the context of like perhaps an outlier season last year and in 2019 his touchdown rate like touchdowns per carry essentially was 2.3 percent and he had 11 carries within the 10 yard line and three touchdowns that represented 100 percent of his total touchdowns on the season he had three touchdowns on the season all of them came within the 10 yard line but those 11 carries were just 8.3 percent of his total carries next year in 2020 he, he had a very low touchdown rate 0.9 percent he had 10 carries within the 10 yard line zero touchdowns he went well, he only had one touchdown on the year, and it didn't come within the 10-yard line. But those those 10 carries within the 10 represented just 8.6% of his carries. So basically the same as the year before. And then last year in 2021, his touchdown rate jumped from 2.3 and 0.9 to 5.8%, which is really high. He had 25 carries within the 10-yard line, 10 touchdowns within the 10-yard line, representing 83% of his total touchdowns, and 12.1% of his total carries. So his workload... Inside the 10s went way up. His total touchdowns inside the 10s went way up. His total carries inside the 10s went way up. He just became used more down near the goal line, and he was better down near the goal line, really. But did Eckler suddenly become an elite touchdown scorer? Did the Chargers offense become elite? I think it's kind of both. So we saw him play better, and we saw him get more opportunity there. But also, the Chargers in 2019 were the 21st ranked offense as far as like points go. In 2020, they were the 19th ranked offense in points. And in 2021, they were the 5th ranked offense in points. They scored 12, 12, and then 18 rushing touchdowns, respectively, as a team in those years. Austin Eckler, I think, has been mostly the same player for his entire career, but he was on a way better offense last year. And if you look at like relative success rate, which measures how often is a player like gaining a requisite amount of yards, given down in distance, given the box counts he's seeing relative to his teammates. So like how often is he succeeding on his carries considering the context of the offense he's in and considering the context of the carries that he's getting, he had a negative relative success rate. So succeeding less often than the other guys in the Chargers offense against heavy boxes, which essentially is you know, like short yarded situations for the most part against heavy boxes in 2019 and 2020, but he was elite there in 2021. And so there was this convergence of the Chargers offense got really good. Austin Eckler played a lot better in short yard situations. That equals like outlier touchdown efficiency. And I think the team is still trying to make this into a committee. I think the situation they had with Melvin Gordon and Austin Eckler, like pairing together a couple years ago was ideal for them. Eckler is a great player. I love him. He's a little bit undersized and I don't think coaches want him to carry the full load like he did last season long term. He's also 27 or he's going to be 27 going into this year. You know, they've had like Kalen Balazs, Josh Kelly, Larry Roundtree the last couple of years. Those guys have just not been it, but they keep like trying to plug somebody else into this like sidekick role next to Eckler. Now they have Isaiah Spiller. I don't think he's particularly better than those guys. He's better than Kalen Balazs, but like I don't think he's that much better than like Joshua Kelly or Larry Roundtree, but they keep trying new things. There's a chance that like Isaiah Spiller latches on in this role. I don't think we should see like the same sort of like really heavy usage, maybe even close to the goal line that we saw from Austin Eckler last season, which is why I'm slightly lower on him relative to ADP. My RB9 is Christian McCaffrey, and basically the thing with him is 
I made a I made a Christian McCaffrey video like I think it's like two months ago now, but I feel pretty much the same way as I did then. Um, if he plays anything close to a full season, like he could win you your league. Every time we've seen Christian McCaffrey play in like the last three or four years, he's been easily the RB one in fantasy on like a per game basis. I would imagine he's still something close to that. Um, it's it's hard to say like how many times can a guy miss you know eighty percent of the season due to injuries, and we still expect him to be the next the same player in the next season. But we haven't seen him slow down yet, and so we still feel like there's like this incredible upside represented by him just being on the field. The problem is that he's now 26 and 26 year old running backs, even when healthy, don't often finish as like elite top five running backs. And he's played less than a third of his team's games in the last two years. Like he's been hurt constantly in the last two years. He's presumably healthy now, but given his age, given his recent history of injuries, it's very difficult to bet on him to stay healthy through an entire season, even through most of an entire season. He's currently being drafted as the RB3 in Dynasty, and even if he does stay healthy and, like, balls out, I I see, like, no way that he increases in value from this season to next season. Like, think about a year from now. A healthy Christian McCaffrey just played well. He finished as, like, you know, the RB1 through 4 in fantasy because he played well. He probably won some people some titles, but now he's a 27-year-old running back. Like, you you can't take him at RB3 next season when we've got B. John Robinson and... Zach Evans and, you know, all these dudes, Jonathan Taylor, like he's not going to be the RB3 next offseason, I think regardless of what he does this season because of his age. And I think we're not baking in the possibility that like, even if he doesn't miss games, the chance that like age and injuries have diminished his ability is just not being baked into his cost right now. But you don't have to be the one in your league to buy all of that risk. Like just pass on Christian McCaffrey at RB3. I'm, I'd be much more comfortable taking him later when I already have like a couple guys on my team. He's more interesting in Superflex for that reason. But I don't want to go into a startup and have Christian McCaffrey be my first player off the board because then I lock myself into this like win now mode and tie my team's destiny so much into what happens with Christian McCaffrey. What if he gets hurt? Then you're fucked. So I like him. I think the risk is a little bit greater than what's represented in his ADP right now. And for that reason, I have an RB9 and not at RB3. My RB8 right now is Dalvin Cook, and I didn't realize this going into this exercise, but I'm a little bit higher on Dalvin Cook than consensus right now. He's currently being drafted as the RB12. I have him at RB8. Last season, he played great, and really, he's been great throughout his entire career, but I I recently stumbled across an article by a guy named Danny, I don't know how to say this last name, Tuchito, I think, Danny, T-U-C-C-I-T-T-O. Anyway, I don't remember where the website was, but Danny Tuchito wrote an article back in 2014 about when do yards and touchdowns per carry, so yards per carry and touchdown rate, when do they stabilize for NFL running backs? And basically what that means is Alvin Kamara came into the league in 2017 and was like the most efficient running back we've ever seen, essentially. That was on like a 140 carry sample or whatever it was. So should we view Alvin Kamara from that point on going forward as like a six and a half yard per carry guy? Probably not. Joe Mixon came into the league that same year and averaged like, I don't know, 3.6 yards per carry or or whatever it was. He was an incredible player in college. Should we now just view him as like, oh, we saw him play in the NFL and he was really inefficient. So going forward, we should always expect Joe Mixon to average 3.6 yards per carry. No. What Danny Tuchito found in his analysis is that it takes 667 carries for touchdown rate to stabilize to the point where like, okay, now we have a good idea of how a player performs in this particular metric and we're able to project them reasonably going forward. Dalvin Cook hit 667 carries in week 12 of 2020. At that point in his career, his touchdown rate was 4.4%, which essentially means he scored a touchdown or what, 4.4 touchdowns per 100 carries, essentially. In 2019, the year right before that, his touchdown rate was 5.2%. In 2020, that same season, his touchdown rate was 5.1%. He finished as the RB2 and as the RB3 in those respective seasons. And then last year, in 2021, he finished as the RB11 with a touchdown rate of 2.4%, which is 2% lower than the stabilized touchdown rate that we should be able to trust going forward. Not that it'll always be exactly that, but like that's essentially the kind of player that he is. 2% lower than that and more than half of what it had been in recent seasons. So we're left to wonder, did Dalvin Cook suddenly become like a bad player incapable of scoring touchdowns or did something just kind of fluky happen and he didn't score a lot of touchdowns last season? I think it's clearly the latter. If you look at like advanced rushing efficiency metrics, box adjusted efficiency rating is one that I like to use, um, which looks at 
what is a player's per carry output worth relative to the per carry output of his teammates given the box counts that he's seeing? So, you know, guys see different box counts than what their teammates see. And so like yards per carry isn't a great, um, you know, kind of one-to-one comparison, but we can divide things up further by box counts using a weighted average, blah, blah, blah. Producing a percent that represents, you know, 100% would be a guy is producing at exactly the same rate as his teammates. Below 100%, he's being outdone by them. Above 100%, he's outdoing them. In 2019, Dalvin Cook's box adjusted efficiency rating was 96.7%. So the average carry for Cook was worth slightly less than the average carry for other Minnesota running backs. That's in the 44th percentile. So, you know, a little bit of a down year that year. He had been good previously. In 2020, jumped up to 108%, 61st percentile. In 2021, the average carry for Dalvin Cook was worth 129% the output for other Minnesota running backs. That's in the 84th percentile. He was one of the best running backs on a per carry basis in the entire league last year. He's just one of the best pure runners in the league. He just happened to not score that many touchdowns. If Dalvin Cook had done exactly what he did last year, but he had his career touchdown rate instead of the perhaps fluky touchdown rate he did have last year. So if we replace his 2.4% touchdown rate with the 4.4% touchdown rate that we should expect going forward, he would have been the RB6 instead of the RB11. He's missed at least two games in every season of his career. The little injuries have piled up. There's a new offense. But otherwise, I don't have any questions about Dalvin Cook. He's an elite talent. He's played at an elite level for a long time now. He generally scores touchdowns. He just happened to not last year. I'm not sure what makes him the RB12. Like, he's clearly just one of the best running backs in the league, and I'm very comfortable taking him within the top 10 running backs in Dynasty. My RB7 is Joe Mixon, who has three RB1 finishes in the last four years, and somehow it still feels like we have not seen, like, a fully unleashed Joe Mixon. We saw him be an elite, like, downfield, you know, explosive pass catcher in college. He has not been used that way in the NFL. We just haven't seen it. I mean, he still hasn't had more than 55 targets or 43 receptions in a single NFL season. He approached those totals in college seasons that are like four and five games shorter. He's he's an elite runner. He's had elite team relative efficiency in three of the last four seasons. Basically, the thing with Joe Mixon is that we know what he is. He's he's going to finish as like the RB8, the RB9, the RB7, somewhere in like the mid RB1 range. And yet there's still this like hypothetical upside represented by like his talent level that we just haven't seen fully unlocked for whatever reason coaches haven't given him the opportunity to like catch the ball and be deployed in ways that hypothetically you know he should be given what we saw from him in college but still he's got a three down skill set he's one of the best you know efficient runners in the league he's locked into an elite young offense he's still only 25 that's a year younger than Austin Eckler, Alvin Kamara, Dalvin Cook, Leonard Fournette, Kareem Hunt. It's a year younger than all of those guys. That's kind of the tiebreaker between him and Dalvin Cook for me. But I think we know what we're getting with Joe Mixon. He's a safe pick. And there's this like small chance that maybe he gets unlocked with this pass catching role. I know you're, you can't bank on that, but there's that that chance. But just given the safe high floor you get with Joe Mixon on this young offense, he's my RB7. My RB6 in Dynasty is Javante Williams, um, who I think, I made a video about him a couple weeks ago. He's a dynamic and explosive, though I think perhaps unpolished runner. Um, He's also a solid receiver. 2021 just feels like another weighted out year for him. He's good enough to capitalize if he gets like the full opportunity to just like take over this backfield in 2022. We're just making a lot of assumptions about how things have to go in order to get there and get value out of his current ADP. He's currently being taken as, what, the RB5 in Dynasty, so I have him one spot back, a little bit lower than him, or lower on him than consensus, but I think the addition of Russell Wilson helps us, like, cut some of those corners to get value out of his ADP. He doesn't have to be Najee Harris as far as, like, workload goes in order to make good on his ADP. Um, He can share carries with Melvin Gordon this year, and I think still finish as an RB1 if they let Melvin Gordon go and don't replace Melvin Gordon. It's obviously wheels up next season, but I think I would rather proceed with caution than get like two out ahead of myself and take Javante Williams in the first round of a dynasty startup as like the most important player on my team. But I do understand the appeal. My RB5 is Travis Etienne. And I know that this ranking is aggressive. It's very aggressive. He's currently being drafted as what? I think the RB19, I believe. Maybe the RB14, given the the new monthly update. It's a very aggressive ranking. And I understand that. And it necessarily involves a lot of trust in two things that a lot of people might not be willing to put trust in. The first of those things is ETN's talent, which I think we haven't seen him in the NFL yet, but I think we have a window into that through his prospect profile. He was taken in the first round, first of all, which... 
I don't evaluate prospects vis-a-vis draft capital, but lots of people do, so that's some confirmation for them. But if you just ignore that, he's one of the most productive running backs in ACC history, one of the most productive running backs in college football history, really, one of the most efficient and dynamic runners in recent college football history, his box-adjusted efficiency rating in college, 130%, 77th percentile, relative success rate, he was succeeding on 4% greater of his runs than other running backs at Clemson, which is like a legitimate top-tier program that gets talented recruits. He's he's outperforming a really good group of teammates there. That's in the 58th percentile, and he became a great receiver during his time at Clemson, um, a dynamic receiver, and he's 5'10", 215 with 4'5 speed. Like, we should have no questions about really any aspect of his, of his collegiate prospect profile, like size, check, athleticism, check, ability to run the ball, check, ability to catch the ball, check, explosive playmaking, check. The only issue with him as a prospect was that he didn't declare early, but he didn't become less talented because of that. We just got fewer seasons of him in the NFL because of that. We also got fewer seasons of him in the NFL because he missed his, you know, rookie season due to a Liz Frank injury. And that's the second thing you have to make some assumptions about that you have to put some trust in is ETN's health. In my ETN versus JK Dobbins video from a couple months ago, um, I referenced an article from, I believe the University of Pennsylvania. Um, I, I don't remember top of my head right now, but it said that 93% of players who suffer Liz Frank injury return to play. This is NFL players. 93% of them return to play with no statistically significant decrease to performance within 15 months. 15 months from the time of ETN's injury would be November, except he's already healthy. He's already explosive, according to reports out of like OTAs and stuff. They're already looking to, you know, split him out wide. And, you know, who knows if he ends up in the Debo Samuel role or whatever the fuck. But it seems like he's ready to go. And like, especially by the time September rolls around, it seems like he's going to be ready to go. And we've seen James Robinson be an RB1 on this terrible team. Um, They should be better going forward, better offensive, you know, kind of situation. They added a few pieces at receiver, you know, kind of laughably gave a bunch of money to Christian Kirk, but that's better than what they had before. Crazier things have happened than like Trevor Lawrence figuring it out in year two. He was the greatest quarterback prospect of all time. Like that guy can't figure it out. We'll see. And then there's this thing about, like, Doug Peterson likes to use a committee, blah, blah, blah. Like, I get that a little bit, but, like, the running backs we've seen Doug Peterson put in a committee are, like, Sharkhandrick West, Miles Sanders, LeGarrett Blunt, Jordan Howard. Back in the day, he had, like, Jamal Charles, who was part of a committee, but he was also, like, 195 pounds. Travis Etienne is 215 pounds with the closest skill set we've seen to Jamal Charles, maybe since Jamal Charles. If, if anybody's not going to be in a committee, it's going to be Travis Etienne, especially given the guys behind him, like James Robinson, Torres Achilles, who knows what he looks like week one or even this season. Snoop Connor is the most likely guy, I think, to be part of this committee. He's a pretty blah player, but but I could see that. Raquel Armstead is a guy I like. I'm not sure if the coaching staff likes him, given the investment in Snoop Connor. And then they've got guys like Makai Sargent, Nathan Cottrell, who are really nothing. There's not a lot of pieces here to like form a committee around Travis. Travis Etienne, but even if he is in some sort of committee, like Miles Sanders' usage for a guy this talented would be fine. Jamal Charles' usage for a guy this talented would be fine. Ryan Matthews' usage for a guy this talented would be fine, and they're not going to be a great team, but there's a chance that they're better than people expect, and James Robinson was already really productive on this bad team. So I'm in on Travis Etienne. If he had been healthy last year, who knows where he's going in Dynasty right now. Maybe as the RB2. I think he's going to be selected way higher next offseason than he is being selected right now. You don't have to take him at RB5. This is not advice to take him at RB5 because that would be just, you know, voluntarily like giving up a ton of value you get by just like waiting and taking him near his ADP. But this is where I would rank him if like the trade market didn't exist and I just had to pick players in the order that I want them. I want Travis Etienne ahead of all but four other running backs in Dynasty right now. My RB4 is Brees Hall, who the case for him is basically that he's young. He turned 21 like a week ago. He's big and explosive. He was productive and efficient in college. He's a solid pass catcher. He was drafted early and should have high opportunity on a hypothetically like ascending offense with a talented quarterback. That's about it. Um, I have concern. I have some concern about him. You know, his polish as a runner. He was efficient in college, not particularly consistent on like a down to down basis. My interview with Graham Barfield, he sounded like he shared some of the same concerns about like his his nuance at the line of scrimmage and things like that. But the convergence of like talent, opportunity, and age is really better here than with any other running back in Dynasty. So Brees Hall is my RB four. My RB3 is DeAndre Swift, and it is just very true that Swift was a bad runner last season. 45th percentile in box-adjusted efficiency rating, 8th percentile in relative success rate, and I use a kind of composite score using the percentile ranks of those two metrics to sort of represent, like, 
the overall efficiency of a runner. And among running backs with at least 100 carries last season, only Alex Collins had a lower composite score than DeAndre Swift did in 2021. He was really bad, really bad in the context of other high volume runners. And yet he finishes the RB 10 in points per game on an offense that was 25th in points and 22nd in yards in the league. He's just smashed in fantasy regardless of being bad on a per carry basis. And I don't think we should expect him to be bad on a per carry basis going forward. In 2020, his box adjusted efficiency rating was in the 70th percentile. His relative success rate was in the 91st percentile. Going back to college, his box adjusted efficiency rating was in the 64th percentile. His relative success rate was only in the 28th percentile in college. And so I think that he might have a little bit of like boom bust to him, a little bit of like more athlete than pure runner especially like between the tackles and things like that to his game, similar to like Brees Hall. But I think he's like an efficient runner overall. We've already seen him be successful in fantasy without being efficient, but I think we should see him, you know, kind of return to efficiency this next year. He's still only 23 and just one of two things needs to happen. A, Swift needs to play better, which I think given his history, 2021 is the aberration. We've seen him be efficient the rest of his career going back to college. Or number two, the Lions offense needs to get better. And I think they've added DJ Chark. They've added James. Jameson Williams. Like, we should expect this offense to be better going forward. It seems likely that both of those things could happen, that, like, DeAndre Swift could play better and the Lions could play better. He was already RB10 on an offense that was bad while he was playing bad. What if he plays good and the offense is a little bit better? It's wheels up. Like, he had the fourth most running back targets in 13 games in 2021. He was an elite receiver in college. This is a full skill set player on an offense that should be better. We should expect him to play better. I'm fully in on DeAndre Swift as the RB3 in Dynasty. My RB2 is Najee Harris, and I know he's being drafted as the RB2. A lot of people, despite that being like crowdsourced ranking based on ADP, a lot of people seem to not like Najee Harris because he was inefficient last year, and I think that's like an illegitimate beef. Since 2016, only Ezekiel Elliott has had a higher box-adjusted efficiency rating in a single season among running backs with 300 or more carries than Najee Harris had last year. So basically what that means is among like super high-volume runners, only one player in the last six years has outproduced on a per carry basis, his teammates to a greater degree than Najee Harris did last year. His box adjusted efficiency rating was lower across the entire league than only Rashad Penny last year, and his relative success rate was 17.3%. He was succeeding on nearly 20% more of his carries than the other running backs at, at Pittsburgh. That's the highest among lead backs in the last six years. As far back as box count data goes, Najee Harris was the absolute best in that metric. And yes, I know. Benny Snell, Kalen Balazs, and Anthony McFarland, they sucked last year, they're not good, they're not talented, and they only combined for 51 carries. Like, ideally, we have a larger sample size from the other guys on the team from which to, from which to like, compare Najee Harris, but if a guy's on a terrible team with a terrible offensive line and bad teammates at running back, what else do you want him to do but, like, dominate the touches in the backfield and smash the efficiency of the other guys? Like, I get that, like, this particular metric is difficult to like draw strong conclusions from because of the small sample, relatively small sample from his teammates. But like, it's a good thing that Najee Harris made it so there was a small sample from his teammates. If Najee Har or if Kalen Balaj, Benny Snell, and Anthony McFarlane got more touches, that's a bad thing for Najee Harris. Like, why can't he put their asses on the bench? But he did, and he smashed their efficiency. Like, and and even if we go back to his time at Alabama, like you can't just say Najee Harris was inefficient last year, so he's bad. A the Pittsburgh Steelers offense was inefficient last year. That's not his fault. He was efficient to a great degree in the context of the offense. If you're trying to build the argument that like Najee's inefficiency was his fault, we can just go back to Alabama. 76th percentile or greater box adjusted efficiency rating every year at Alabama. 82nd percentile or greater relative success rate. Two out of three seasons in which box count data is available from Alabama. That's that's competing with running backs that are more talented than Balazs, Snell, and McFarland are, and he was elite compared to them. Like, why are we assuming that he's now just some sort of like inefficient plotter because he got drafted to a team that we knew had a terrible offensive line. Doesn't make any sense. He's big and he catches passes. He's got a full skill set. He's on a bad team, but he already produced on a bad team. And there aren't younger or better options in Dynasty right now who check the boxes that he checks. Like, I would put DeAndre Swift ahead of him if I could, but I don't think he's going to get the workload that Najee Harris is going to get. I would put Brees Hall ahead of him if I could, but I haven't seen it from him, from him in the NFL yet. Like, I know that Najee Harris is good. I know that he gets a lot of work, and I think that'll happen with Brees Hall. And if it does, he'll probably flip-flop for me in Dynasty next year. But for now... Najee Harris is the default RB2. It's not fun to take him there because the Steelers are really bad, but he deserves it. He's the RB2 in Dynasty. 
My RB1 in Dynasty is Jonathan Taylor. Obviously, there's not much analysis here, so I'll just rattle off some stats that are like fun and highlight how good Jonathan Taylor is. 38.8% dominator rating as a 22-year-old last season. That's the same dominator rating that Emmett Smith had as a 22-year-old. And in my database, that's higher than Ezekiel Elliott, Edger and James, Barry Sanders, Ladanian Tomlinson, Marshall Falk, higher than all those guys had as 22-year-olds. Among running backs drafted since 2007, only Adrian Peterson had a higher age 22 dominator rating than Jonathan Taylor's 38.8%, and Adrian Peterson's age 22 dominator rating was 38.9%. So Jonathan Taylor is essentially the best 22-year-old running back we've seen in the last 15 years. He's also an elite runner, 92nd percentile box adjusted efficiency rating, 93rd percentile relative success rate on the most carries in the NFL in 2021. He was 82nd percentile and 95th percentile in the same categories on 232 carries in 2020. He's young, he's big, he's athletic, he's productive, he's efficient, He's a functional receiver. He's on a decent team. Just smash, smash, smash. Even going back to college, 97th percentile volume, 73rd percentile box adjusted efficiency rating, 67th percentile relative success rate. He's been elite every season of his career since we've seen him from high school. He's arguably the greatest college running back of all time. He's just easy RB1. Everybody loves Jonathan Taylor. I love Jonathan Taylor. He's great. Those are my top 10 running backs. Next video will probably be RB 11 through 20. I might do an RB 21 through 30 video if that's something that the people want. Thanks for watching. Leave a comment, subscribe, like, follow me on Twitter, DM me, send nudes. Have a great week. Peace.